you're diving into the fascinating world of speech sounds, then one of your very first stops has to be learning about one very fun and important tool called the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet. Put your tongue forward until it squeezes on the top of your lower teeth. Then say, cup, 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 off, 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 cup, 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 off, 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 off. In today's video, you're gonna learn what the IPA is and how to use it. And for those of you who might not know me yet, I'm Emily. I have long been fascinated by language, so much so that I went and got my PhD in linguistics. And now the best part is that I get to share all of the information that I've learned about how language works with you. Without further ado, let's get started. Oh, and sidebar, if you missed our primer video on how speech sounds work, here are two quick terms that you need to know. The name for the scientific study of human speech sounds is phonetics, and the people who study phonetics are called phoneticians. If you wanna know more about phonetics, phoneticians, or fun facts about your speech stream, then go back and listen to that primer video, which we've linked for you in the description. Otherwise, onward. Okay, so what is the International Phonetic Alphabet? Well, in the most basic sense, it's literally a single sheet of paper. But more specifically, it's a common set of symbols, an alphabet, if you will, for representing all the possible sounds that could exist across human languages. Now, the main takeaway is this. If you can make a sound with your mouth, the IPA has a unique symbol to represent it. For example, the click sounds that you make with your tongue, the IPA has symbols for those. The Sid the Sloth's iconic Sid the Sloth sound from the movie Ice Age. Doesn't anyone love me? Isn't there anyone who cares about Sid the Sloth? The IPA has got a symbol for that. And the sound you make to imitate a lawnmower, yeah, the IPA has a symbol for that too. And fun fact, even though we don't use those sounds in English, they're all real sounds used in phonetic systems in other languages. Clicks, for example, are very common in African languages. The sh sound is used in Icelandic, and the brr, which is my personal favorite, is used in several languages spoken in Papua New Guinea. Now, the IPA doesn't just provide us with symbols to represent all of these sounds. It also provides us with clear, descriptive, and technical terms by which we can describe them. For example, the technical term for my personal favorite sound, the brr, is a voiced bilabial trill. And by the end of this video, you'll have a much clearer understanding of how IPA symbols get their technical names. Now, the IPA is obviously a very helpful tool for trained phoneticians, but it's also quite useful for any curious mind who wants to be able to read the phonetic transcriptions and dictionary entries, or for language learners who want to better understand how to make specific sounds in their target language. And here's some really good news. If you already know written English, you're already halfway there to understanding IPA. That's because while the IPA does rely on a lot of Greek letters and other symbols that you might be unfamiliar with, it does use most of the letters from the English alphabet. So what do you need to know about the IPA in order to start reading and writing it? Well, like I said earlier, the IPA is one single sheet of paper, but there is a lot of information on it. So where should you start? Well, you should start with the consonant chart and the vowel map. Those are your keys to understanding the IPA. Everything else is just details. Consonants are sounds like b, d, g, ch, and vowels are sounds like a, a, e, o, u. Now, let's start with the consonant chart. The consonant chart is simply a table made up of a bunch of columns and rows. The columns are organized by something called the place of articulation, which really just means where in your mouth touching needs to happen in order to make the sound. So as you move from left to right on the consonant chart, the place of articulation within your mouth moves from the front to the back. For example, the leftmost column is called bilabial. So that column contains all the bilabial consonants. Bilabial literally means two lips. So this requires touching at the very front of your mouth. Some consonants in the bilabial column include b, p, m, and my favorite one, the b. Now all the way to the rightmost column, you'll see glottal sounds. The name comes from the epiglottis, which is one of your articulators way back in the back of your mouth, almost at your throat. As you can see, the names of the columns oftentimes give you a hint as to what in your mouth needs to be touching in order to make the sound happen. Okay, so the columns tell you the place of articulation. What do the rows tell you? Well, the rows tell you the manner of articulation for the consonant. Now, the manner of articulation has to do with, well, the manner in which your articulators in your mouth move to modify airflow in your vocal tract. For example, the first row is labeled plosives. Plosives include sounds like p, 
t k b d g. And are sounds that start with your mouth closed and then end with a burst of airflow being released all at once. Now, if we go down a few rows, you'll see a row for trills. Trills are the sounds like the Spanish r or my favorite lawnmower sound, the b, where a repetitive sound happens in quick succession. So now we know that the column that a consonant is in tells us its place of articulation, and the row that it's in tells us its manner of articulation. There's one thing left. If we think back to my favorite sound, the voiced bilabial trill, you know that bilabial refers to the place of articulation, meaning both lips touching, and the trill refers to the manner of articulation, so the lips touching multiple times in quick succession. But what does that word voiced mean? Well, it has to do with your vocal cords, basically whether or not they're vibrating. If your consonant is voiced, that means your vocal cords are vibrating. If the consonant is voiceless, they're not vibrating. And you can actually test this out right now by touching your throat as you say v, which is a voiced consonant, and f, which is a voiceless consonant. See, now you know how the voiced bilabial trill gets its technical name. And more importantly, you also now have everything you need to start exploring the consonant chart on your own. But before you do that, let's talk vowels. That means we're headed over to the vowel map. Now there's a lot of cool stuff to know about vowels, but we're just gonna go over the basics. The main thing that you should take away is that the vowel map is organized by the location of your tongue in your mouth. For example, the higher a vowel is on the vowel map, the higher your tongue needs to be in your mouth to make that vowel sound. High vowels like e and u require the tongue to be higher in the mouth than say low vowels like e and a. And the further to the right the vowel is on the map, the further back horizontally your tongue needs to be in your mouth to produce that vowel sound. For example, vowels on the left side of the vowel map like e and a require the tongue to be further at the front of your mouth compared to vowels on the right side like u and o. Now, you probably already know this, but it's worth mentioning. Not all languages have the same organization or even number of vowels in their vowel systems. That's because every language has its own way of dividing up the possible sounds of human speech. This goes for consonants as well as vowels. Well, my friends, there you have it. From clicks to trills, consonant charts to vowel maps, we covered a lot of ground in this video. The main takeaway you should be leaving with is this. The IPA is a very special piece of paper that with just a little studying, you can use to unlock the speech sounds to all of the world's languages. And now that you've finished the video, I hope that you have a clear understanding of what the IPA is and how to use it. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, let us know by hitting that like button and subscribing to the channel. As always, if you have an idea for a video that you'd like to see from us, then let us know in the comments. We're always listening. Oh, and last thing. To help you explore the IPA and actually start to use it, we created a bunch of cool, free resources for you to use, which you can access through the link in the description. They include a cheat sheet to help you remember everything that we covered in today's video, and a deciphering the IPA worksheet, which can help you explore and practice using the IPA yourself, which is pretty nerdy and cool. For watching. I'm here to remind you to get your free goodies, which you can access through the link right here on the screen. In our next video, we'll be moving on from individual speech sounds and diving into what happens when we put those sounds together, which means we're talking about phonology. And if you want to be the first to know when that video goes live, then ring that notification bell. In the meantime, you can catch up on all of our existing videos right here. Well, see you next time on Adventures in Language. Bye!